step. Perfect. So uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us uh, for our coffee morning today. Uh, today, we are privileged to have uh, our guest speaker, who is the Associate Head of Research and Innovation at the University of Portsmouth. Uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Jennifer Rodis to talk about her work on pressure sores or bed sores in older people. Uh, Jenny. Thank you, Mike. Um, so yes, thank you for the introduction and thank you for allowing me to join your meeting today. Um, I just, I'm not gonna present slides. Um, I have sent Mike some slides, um, but I will just present the last one um, with contact details because it kind of feels like it's, I'm hiding behind them if I, if I present slides. Um, just to be really clear at the start, I think I'm not clinical. My background isn't clinical. Um, and Carol, my colleague, her background um, isn't in, in pressure sores. So just to be aware, we can't answer any kind of clinical questions, more than happy to answer any questions about the project, but not anything clinical, um, just because I wouldn't, wouldn't know where to start. Um, so just uh, a bit of background. Um, and before I think about kind of the wider background, just some comment on terminology. So. I'll probably use the term pressure ulcers throughout the throughout this talk because that's what we um, that's what they call clinically. They're most commonly known as bed sores um, from a, a, a lay perspective, but my clinical colleague um, always has a comment around bed sores because her, her argument is they often don't form when one's in bed. They often form um, when people are sat in their in a chair instead of in bed. Um, because chairs obviously have funny angles and, and have funny pressure points. Um, and she always says they're not necessarily sore. So you can develop a pressure ulcer um, without it, in the first instance at least, without it being particularly painful or um, and so on. So it, it, when I refer to pressure ulcers, what I mean is, is an injury to the skin. Um, but like I say, they, they're co more commonly known as bed sores, but it's a bit of an inaccurate terminology. Um, they're also known as pressure injuries, um, decubitus ulcers, which is a bit of an old terminology. So there's kind of quite a lot of terminology, but I will refer to them throughout as, as pressure ulcers. Um, like I said, they don't always result from being in bed. They don't always cause pain, um, at least in the first instance. There's a number of risk factors associated with uh, pressure ulcers. Um, being over 70 is one of them. And that's to do with, it's less to do with um, mobility, more to do with skin changes as we get older. Um, and the skin is, is um, the skin that changes in ways that make it more susceptible to um, pressure ulcers. Um, lacking mobility. So combined with the kind of age factor, but also um, moving around a bit less, um, people who maybe have long-term conditions or long-term pain, um, who are maybe not moving around in um, the same way as they used to. Um, being unable to feel pain, because obviously if you can't feel pain, you can't tell if, if a pressure also is um, potentially developing. Um, being very underweight or very overweight are risk factors. A poor diet, because your skin isn't healing in the same way as it might do otherwise and then um, several uh, long-term conditions that also increase risk and they include things like diabetes, heart failure, multiple sclerosis, um, Parkinson's disease um, and in, in the slides um, if Mike sends them around there's some pictures of areas vulnerable to pressure, but essentially if you're either sat down or lay down it's the points that are kind of always um, always in contact with the wherever you, whatever you're sat or lay on. So if you lay on your back, it's the back of your head, shoulders, elbows, um, tailbone and heels. Because if you think about it, they're the bits that are always in contact with the, with the mattress. Um, if you're sat in a chair, for example, it's again, shoulder blades, tailbone, um, back of knee, because obviously the back of your knee is against a chair. Um, and uh, foot again, because you tend to have your foot against um, a chair. And if you lay on, if you tend to, to be laying on your side um, in bed, it's also things like the ears, um, hip bones, 
because again, it's those bits of you that are kind of in contact um, with the mattress and then ankles as well. You can also develop pressure and uh, pressure ulcers as, as a result of medical devices. So if there's, um, say, a tube connecting with the, rubbing against the skin and that kind of thing, um, and you, it, whilst we say pressure ulcers are, are more of a risk for older people, you can get them in um, premature babies if they're if they're using medical devices to keep them breathing and so on. So they're not kind of exclusive to to older people. Um, it's just obviously like I say that that's the group we're looking at so um number in terms of cold hard facts 700,000 people a year in the UK have had pressure ulcer of who make 180,000 um develop a new one every year cost the NHS 3.8 million um and around four percent of the NHS budget is spent on care for people with pressure ulcers so they're quite a big issue um but also from a very personal basis, people um, are often restricted in what they can do. They, um, they, can, they can be very painful. If they become infected, they can, um, they can lead to a, a not very nice odor. And um, they, they can, particularly if they're infected, things like leading to hospital stays, but also they, they can be lethal um, just by virtue of the, the risk of infection. So they're not, um, it, it, when we talk about bed sores, it kind of comes across as a bit of a kind of something, nothing, a bit of an, a bit of an injury to the skin and, and not very serious, but actually pressure ulcers can be quite, quite serious. And like I say, can be life-threatening. So um, our project came from a conversation between myself and a clinical colleague about the fact that we, we've got all this information about how to treat and prevent pressure ulcers in hospitals, which is great, but what we don't know is what about in the community setting. So we know lots about hospitals, we know about care homes to a certain extent, but in both those settings there's staff around, there's people around who can make sure that the things that prevent pressure ulcers, such as movement, such as a healthy diet, such as um, using certain equipment in certain ways, um, so certain mattresses or cushions, that kind of thing um, can help prevent pressure ulcers. That's all well and good in a setting where there's people around you, but if you're living in your own home and maybe you're living on your own or you're living with someone who um, may have their own health conditions and therefore can't help you to move, can't help to make sure you have a nutritious meal and that kind of thing. Actually, we have no idea what people do or don't do. Um, so, and the reality is we all know, any, anyone going into um, someone's own home in terms of community care, it's incredibly limited. It, you know, someone turns up to do X, Y, and Z and they leave again because the, pre the pressures on the NHS are, are what they are. So we know that people, um, so one of the recommendations for reducing the risk of pressure ulcers is to move quite frequently. Um, the, the guidance kind of says two to six hours. But if you're in bed, um, because the district nurse is coming at six o'clock and essentially put you to bed because that's their timings until someone comes and gets you up at eight o'clock the next morning you're definitely not moving um and you lack mobility you're probably not going to be moving enough in that time frame um so what our project is kind of seeking to find out is in that community setting where people are living in their own homes essentially what what are people doing um, what are carers doing as well? So lay carers, we don't, we're, not, we're not focused on um, paid carers coming in from the NHS or, or privately. It's, it's very much about lay carers. Um, what do people do? Why do they do it? How do they do it? Essentially, it, what's going on? Because um, like I say, we know absolutely nothing about what goes on in, in people's homes um, in terms of preventing pressure ulcers. The clinical teams are telling me that what they do is go in, they tell someone um, they're at risk of pressure also, they give them a leaflet about what to do 
and then they walk away again because that's the time they've got. So we, it feels very much like clinical teams are going in and giving very minimal information and then patients are kind of being left to it a bit, which, um, so we, th we think there's an issue somewhere with the services as well, but because there's no research at all, we don't know anything. We don't know mm. if people aren't doing anything because they don't know. We don't know if people aren't doing anything because they don't understand how dangerous pressure ulcers can be. We don't know if they're not doing anything because in all honesty, um, they've got 101 other things to think about or actually are people doing what is expected of them? We just don't know. Um, so yes, so the, our project is, is looking at finding new ways of supporting patients and lay carers um, to reduce their risk of, of pressure ulcers. And then the intention is to interview um, people over six, age 65 and over who have limited mobility um, and therefore at risk of pressure ulcers and also their, their lay carers. And we, that will feed into a second stage where we will um, co-design with patients, with their lay carers, but also with professionals, um, some resources to help uh, patients and, and carers to follow that kind of guidance. Um, and that will be, that might be videos, it might be reminders, it might be pictures or diagrams. To be honest, we, we don't know because the, we don't have that background understanding of what people do and why, um, but we also want to design it with patients and carers so that we actually know it hopefully will work um, rather than us kind of going in and saying, this is what will happen. Um, so yeah, that, that's kind of the project um, as it is. We, we have been funded, the, the project is funding, funded, there is um, money in there to pay participants, but there's also money in there for, to pay for uh, patient public involvement um, engagement as well. So it, it, the intention is, um, obviously we've got kind of the research element of it and we're, we're hoping to find people who uh, are carers of people who are at risk of pressure ulcers who will talk to us about their experiences. But we're also, um, as part of the project, we want to set up a, a patient public involvement advisory group um, of people who have had experience of having a pressure ulcer themselves or being at risk of one or have um, cared for someone or are caring for someone who is at risk of or has a pressure ulcer, just to kind of get their input into, okay, it, we want patient information, for example, or participant information. Are we kind of saying the right sort of things? Um, when we get the findings, does it look like we're getting the right sort of answers out of this? Does it all kind of make sense? Um, thinking about the, the second phase, which is the co-design workshop and maybe joining us in those workshops, we, it, theoretically, they're going to be face-to-face -face workshops, but we acknowledge that the people we're working with lack mobility so we might have to do a bit of mix and match where some people can we can get in a room together and some people actually um will uh, we will go to them in their own homes and kind of bring their input into those workshops um we're kind of still trying to work that out we we know we can run the workshops in some way shape or form it's just the kind of making sure we can access the the people we need to access for that so supporting us to kind of design those workshops in a way that they can work um, and that we get those different inputs from different people because it's really valuable you know it really matters to us that we have the right input but it's making it making it work um, and then we also once we once we complete this project the intention is to go out to test um feasibility test and then um fully test the into the the resources um before we can kind of make a recommendation to the nhs that actually we should be promoting these resources to, to patients and carers um and so we'd also like people to kind of have a, some input into designing that next project along um once we're kind of ready to think about funding for that um, so I guess from, from today, I guess what I'm hoping people would do is think about whether they've got that experience, whether they've got kind of cared for someone or are caring for someone or at risk of, or have been at risk of, or have had pressure ulcers, and whether or not they'd be happy to join us on that, 
advisory group, really. Um, and to a certain extent, with as little or as great input as, as anyone wishes to give, um, the, the intention is to have a group of people and we can we can kind of go to people as and when and, you know, acknowledging lives and busyness and so on and so forth. So, and uh, so the contact details I, um, I can show, but Mike has got them. So um, thank you. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, any questions, I guess. Yeah. I'll, I'll stop the recording before we start with questions.